Part 3. Venerable Father Gruff Mechi Bunyu recalled how Luang Po could be especially gruff when Mechis asked permission to visit their family. He would say, What for? Are you homesick? How long have you been here now? The Buddha never visited his home the whole time he was searching for enlightenment. You've only just ordained, and you want to go there already. If he gave permission, he'd say, Go empty-handed, come back empty-handed. Don't carry a basket full there and a basket full back. On the nun's return, he would ask her, How was it? The same way you left it? Did you bring a basket full back with you? He was talking Dhamma language. He meant memories and attachments. If the nun didn't understand, she'd say, Just a few onions and some garlic, Luang Po. Sometimes, he'd ask one of the older mare cheese, How many times did you go home last night? Meaning, how often did her mind go? If the nun didn't understand, she'd say she hadn't been at all. And he'd reply, you just didn't see it go. Ajahn Jan often acted as Luang Po's attendant on his visits to the Mechi section. Luang Po was especially careful in his relations with women. Although he'd never had the experience of running a household, he ran the monastery in an exemplary way. There were never any scandals. There were no serious disputes. He was always on his guard, whether through action or speech. He never gave any of the mere cheese the opportunity to become close to him by any means whatsoever. Lung Por upheld the eight Garudamas. When he spoke to a nun, he didn't look at her face, and he never indulged in worldly, flirtatious speech that might have led her to lose her respect. More than any other group of his disciples, the Mechis tended to hold Luang Po in awe. The monks felt this awe too, and many felt it strongly, but their daily contact with Luang Po and their status as fellow monks gave it a more nuanced character. The lay disciples also felt the awe, but it was felt more intermittently, as the greater part of their daily lives was bound up with family and work. For the Mechis, Luang Po was the reason for the life they led. They looked to him as their father, their teacher, their benefactor. They saw him rarely, and then only on formal occasions, but they felt his presence everywhere. Most, moreover, took it for granted that he knew, through his psychic powers, everything that went on in their lives and minds. Although they admitted wryly that being human this belief did not stop negative emotions flooding through them from time to time. Although Luang Po was supportive in times of genuine crisis, he was also careful to avoid appearing too easily available when problems arose that he wanted them to learn to deal with themselves. Ajahn Jan recalled that one day, while a nun was practicing walking meditation, she had an extremely realistic vision of a huge snake wrapping itself around her body. Unsurprisingly, she fainted. A fellow Mechi, discovering her lying prostrate on the walking path, called for help. More Mechis rushed forward, and, as the reviving nun blurted out the story of the monster snake, a minor panic ensued. Two of the senior Mechis rushed over to Luang Po's Kuti to request his assistance. The nun was very distressed, would he please come to see her straight away? Without expressing the slightest concern, Luang Po said, Maybe she's already dead. Look after her for now, and I'll come over later on. Many hours after the incident, when the excitement had died down, he paid his visit. Kindness at a Distance Luang Po had seen monasteries consumed by sexual scandals. He was determined to prevent the same thing happening at Wat Ba Pong. 
the strict segregation of the monks and mechis he insisted upon was based on his understanding of how the most innocent of relationships could in an unguarded moment and against all the better judgment of either side develop into something more serious. His solution was, figuratively, to keep everyone well away from the edge of the cliff. Although the policy of separation meant that the Mer Chis saw little of Luang Por, and they would undoubtedly have appreciated seeing more of him, they did not expect it. They had little sense of entitlement, having grown up in a world in which the separation between monks and women, whether lay or ordained, was a given. Generally, the only time the Merchis would enter the main area of the monastery was early in the morning while the monks were on arms round. The Merchis, eyes downcast, would walk through the forest to the kitchen where they would help to prepare food. As soon as the meal was over, they would return to the Merchi section. If, for some reason, Merchis should meet a monk on a path, Monastic etiquette required them to squat down with hands in Anjali and look studiously at the ground until the monk, also studiously looking elsewhere, had passed. The absence of even a hint of sexual scandal at Wat Barpong over the years did much to consolidate its good reputation. But newly arrived monks like Ajahn Jan could experience something akin to a culture shock. When I first came to live at Wat Bapong, I didn't know the customs and conventions. I passed a group of Mechis and greeted them loudly. Hello there, what are you all up to? The Mechis looked very shocked and rushed off into the forest. I was baffled, I thought, what is it about forest monasteries? The monks and novices ignore you, even the Mechis won't speak to you. Somebody must have told Luang Po that the new monk was doing a lot of improper things, like talking to Mechis. The next day he explained things to me, and so after that I understood the way things were done. As time went on, a number of Wat Bapong branch monasteries opened Mechi sections, and these were run on the same principles as the one at Wat Bapong although much smaller monasteries usually required some relaxation of the segregation policy. To guard against any risk of impropriety, a Sangha regulation was subsequently laid down, restricting the establishment of Mechi sections to those monasteries in which the abbot had spent at least twenty years in the robes. By the beginning of the 1980s, Luang Por's health was in serious decline, and his visits to the Mechi section became more irregular. With his influence waning, problems in the Mechi community began to increase. Some of the Mechis felt a sense of loss and concern for the future. On one occasion, shortly before his illness, he explained to them, I stay aloof from everyone, aloof from all the Mechis who come to live here. Everyone is free to speak to me, but I don't speak to everyone. Even so, I feel an inner accord with all of you. It's called Dharmic love. It's not a worldly type of love where you have to keep saying nice things to each other all the time, but one in which any problems that arise are discussed in an appropriate way. There are some of you here that I've never spoken to at all. Don't think it's because you are mechis. These days the monastery is very large, and there are monks and novices that I've never spoken to individually. It's difficult for one person to oversee such a big community. That's why, as far as possible, it's important that everyone takes responsibility for themselves and their practice. No Favourites Luang Po had seen in other monasteries how competition for the teacher's attention amongst the resident Mechis could lead to jealousies that undermined the harmony of their community. He maintained a strictly impartial stance towards them. Many of the Mechis were especially impressed by how he refrained from singling out his mother for any special attention or privileges. In the culture in which they lived, 
the willingness to treat one's mother as just one member of a large group was seen as an unusual achievement. The one notable exception to this came with the elaborate funeral that Luang Po arranged for Mayor Pim upon her death in 1976, which featured many days of merit-making activities dedicated to her. This impartiality was not a blanket indifference. On the contrary, as Mayor Chi Bunyu recalled, Luang Po showed a consistent concern for the welfare of every one of the Mayor Chis. The monastery was still quite unknown then, and not many people came to offer food. Usually, the only fruit we'd have would be the small amount that came from the Mechi's garden. One day, a group of lay people came to help with a work project. One of them planted a pineapple shoot near the kitchen, and it grew up into a pineapple, very big it was too, like the ones that nowadays they bring up from the southeast. Pineapples were rare then. Every day, when we went to the kitchen, we'd look at the pineapple and be thinking how big it was becoming and wondering what Luang Po would have done with it when it was ripe. All of us were looking forward to taste it because we'd never eaten a pineapple before in our lives. Then, one day, the pineapple disappeared. Oh no, I wailed in my mind. Where's it gone? Mechi Bunyu found out the next morning. The pineapple had appeared in the kitchen, neatly cut into fifteen equal pieces, one for each of the eight monks and seven Mechis in the monastery. Luang Po was not idealistic about sense restraint. For monastics, training themselves to detach from sense pleasures, enjoyment outlives indulgence and is supplanted by equanimity through insight not by acts of will. For almost all the members of a monastic community, subsisting on a bare diet, a slice of an exotic fruit is a treat. Luang Po did not condemn it as worldly foolishness, and was content to ensure that everyone in the community, including the mere cheese, had an equal share in this treat. It was this kind of consistent but understated consideration, one that belied his forbidding demeanour, that endeared him to the Mechis. Luang Po's concern for the Mechis was clearly apparent to the monks, not least through his regular exhortations on the fair distribution of food. He would remind them to always bear in mind the hard work and sacrifice of the Mechis that made possible the meals they ate, and to make sure that there was always sufficient food sent back to the kitchen. He said that it would be very bad gumma if they took so much that those who had prepared the food went without. The emphasis on fairness and impartiality extended to all of the requisites. Mechi Bunyu recalled the distribution of cloth. Lung Po would distribute the cloth himself. After he'd arranged a pile for each nun, the bell would be rung, and the Mechi would go up to the raised platform in order of seniority and take her cloth. Afterwards, we'd compare the number of pieces, the quality of the cloth, its fineness or coarseness. They would all be exactly the same. To be a Mechi Women applying to join the Mechi community at Wat Bapong were required to undergo a vetting procedure with senior family members expected to act as sponsors and guarantors of their good character. The most basic criteria for acceptance into the community was that the woman should not be pregnant, and this was a chief reason why women accepted into the community would be expected to undergo a probationary period as a laywoman. The probationary period also provided an opportunity for the senior Mechis to observe the applicant's conduct and personality at close quarters and to judge their suitability. The exacting daily schedule and strict regulations played a major role in weeding out the unsuitable candidates. Women applying to join the Mechi community at Wat Bapong were not expected to make commitments as to the length of time they would remain. Some became Mechis for a limited period, perhaps a month. Some intended to spend the rest of their lives in the monastery 
and left after a few days. And then, there were those that came for a short time and ended up staying for the rest of their lives. Most of the Merchis, like the monks, came from peasant farming backgrounds and were used to an active, practical life. They usually found the forest monastic life in which formal meditation periods alternate with the mindful performance of communal tasks such as sweeping, cleaning, cooking and tending the garden provided a good balance. For those who felt that enlightenment was still far away, accumulating merit through wholesome activities provided a reassuring compensation for the frustrations of meditation. Growing vegetables and preparing food constituted the Merchi's primary contribution to the overall functioning of the monastery. As the number of monks and nuns increased to almost a hundred, it became a major daily effort. The work was done in noble silence, punctuated only by unavoidable orders or requests. Subtle points of etiquette concerning such matters as the use of pots and the frequency of hand-washing helped to keep the nuns grounded in the present moment. Cleanliness was an important object of mindfulness for everyone. The Merchis also contributed to most of the major work projects that took place in the monastery over the years. Perhaps their proudest achievement was the firing of the many thousands of bricks that the monks used to construct the monastery wall. Tudong At Wat Bapong, the Merchis were expected to keep many of the Dutanga ascetic practices incorporated into the monks' training. They ate only one meal a day in a single vessel, in their case, a white enamel bowl. Every observance day, they abstained from lying down and spent the night meditating. Many of them took on special practices, such as fasting or keeping silent, in order to accelerate their efforts in meditation. Although it was not considered safe or socially acceptable for Mer Chis to go wandering through the countryside on Tudong like the monks, Lung Po did give the more senior nuns opportunities to practice in wild, lonely areas. With the opening of Tamsang Pet Monastery in 1969 and Wat Kuen the following year, the Sangha acquired large, remote properties where Luang Po would sometimes give permissions for groups of Merchis to live out in the forest under their glots and come face to face with their fears of spirits and wild animals. Living under a glot in the forest, without the protection afforded by a kuti was a daunting challenge, and only the most mature of the nuns were given this opportunity. On her first such expedition, Mer Chi Jan, one of the senior Mer Chi, recounted with amusement how she'd been terrified throughout the night by the eerie sound of what she was sure was a malevolent spirit. The next day, she was the object of some gentle teasing when she found out that what she had been listening to was, in fact, the plaintive sound of a female civet cat abandoned by her mate. But once the Merchis had overcome their initial fears of the forest, they found, like the monks, that life under such conditions gave rise to an alertness and enthusiasm for practice that was profoundly energizing. Admonishment One of the guiding principles of monastic life laid down in the Vinaya is that every monk and nun should make themselves open to admonishment from all other members of their community. But mutual admonishment is not an easy ideal to live up to. In Thailand, the cultural emphasis on preserving social harmony through non-confrontation makes it particularly difficult. Nevertheless, Luang Po would often speak on this topic. One year during the rains retreat period, Luang Po instructed the Merchi community on this principle in detail. By this time, his health was in decline and he had been unable to visit the Merchi section as often as he had in previous years. He emphasized the importance of each Merchi learning how to admonish themselves as a foundation for admonishing others. They had to learn how to teach themselves, how to take care of their minds. 
before admonishing anyone else, you should admonish yourself. Why? Because if you don't, and that person doesn't accept your admonishment, then you may lose your temper. You have to put yourself in a good frame of mind first. Then, if she scolds you or abuses you, you won't let it affect you. You know you've done the right thing. If it's necessary to admonish someone, and they take it well, then that's good. But if they don't, then that's their affair, not yours. If the person you admonished criticizes you, then listen to what they have to say. If she says, you're just jealous of me, ask yourself whether it's true. Investigate it. If it's not, then she's got it wrong, and that's her responsibility. Your practice is to let go, to learn to see everything in terms of Dhamma. Those who received admonishment were to constantly train themselves to be open to the words of others, even if they seemed unfair or inaccurate. Learning how to deal with praise and blame was an essential element of the path to wisdom. You need to learn how to take responsibility for your speech and actions. Then, if you act with a good intention, and you're accused of acting with an impure intention, you can be at ease, because you know your own mind, and you know for sure that it's not true. The Buddha taught us to have mindfulness at all times. When you're going to say something, do you have a good intention? What's the purpose of your words? You have to be aware of your actions. Then, when someone says you spoke improperly, you don't get upset because you considered well before speaking those words. You know your intention was good, and the person who says you did wrong is mistaken. You are at ease. Are you as good as they say? You have to know yourself. Don't believe anyone else. Watch out. They say you're bad. That's someone's words. They say you're good. And it's just words. It's not who you are. Only you know that. We come here to let go. If someone gives you an admonishment, then receive it with a sadhu, glad that you're getting it for free. Whether you're in the right or the wrong, listen. It's through listening that wisdom can arise. He illustrated his advice with his own interpretation of a Zen training method. The Zen masters teach their students to reduce conceit and views. There's not much study involved. If students start to nod while they're sitting in meditation, the teacher hits them on the head with a long stick. The student says, Thank you, sir, for being so kind as to hit me on the head with your stick. It reminded me of what I'm supposed to be doing. Thank you, sir. Can all of you mere cheese living here thank each other for admonition? Give it a try. It takes wisdom. If any of you get drowsy during meditation, have mere chi come far hit you over the head with a stick and then say, thank you. Could you do it? Understand this point. The Mechis were to see how valuable it was to receive admonishment and how fortunate they were to be in a situation where they could receive it. All of you have an advantage over me. I invite you to admonish me if I do something wrong, but it's difficult for you. Nobody does it because I'm the teacher and you don't dare to. That's why practice as a senior monk is so hard. Sometimes the teacher does something wrong, and everyone just lets him carry on doing it without him realizing it's wrong. It's difficult for a teacher to find someone to teach him, but all of you are lucky. If you do something wrong, somebody tells you straight away. It's a really good thing. Don't think negatively about it. Try to see that practice is exactly about things like this. If you let go... If you put something down, it comes to a halt. It's no longer heavy. It's the attachment that's heavy.
Dhamma Teachings The Dhamma teachings Lung Po gave to the Mechis were little different in substance from those that he gave to the monks. Although he might emphasize right speech and various community values a little more at the beginning of the talks to the Mechis, the essence of the instruction he gave was the same. The more profound teachings were given freely. In fact, monks who accompanied Luang Po when he went to teach the Mechis would say that the talks he gave on these occasions were amongst the best they'd ever heard. A passage in which Luang Po related to the nuns, one of his favorite stories, gives the flavor of these talks. One of the supreme patriarchs went on a trip to China where he was presented with a beautiful teacup. The patriarch had never seen anything so beautiful. He started thinking about how he'd show off this gift to all his lay supporters when he got back to Thailand. But as soon as he took the cup into his hands, he started to suffer. Where shall I put it down? Where shall I keep it? He became afraid of breaking the cup. Once the teacup was in his shoulder bag, he constantly reminded his attendant, Be careful with that shoulder bag. The teacup is fragile. Be careful. It was nothing but suffering for him. The patriarch had been having a good time before that. The suffering began as soon as he received the teacup. That's when it became heavy. Sitting on the plane back to Thailand, he would fret whenever the novice went near the shoulder bag. Be careful, it's fragile. If a lay person came close, it was, be careful with that shoulder bag. He suffered all the way back to Thailand because he thought the teacup belonged to him. The suffering came with the attachment. One day, much later, back in his monastery, a novice picked up the cup to have a look at it. The cup slipped through his hands and broke. The supreme patriarch exclaimed with joy, At last! I've been suffering over that cup for years. It's the same with the five aggregates, the khandas. They're heavy. Throw them away. Throw away form, feelings, perceptions, mental formations and consciousness. Don't take any of them as self or as belonging to self. They are merely form, merely feelings merely perceptions, merely mental formations, and merely consciousness, that's all. Don't grasp on to any of them. Seeing their true nature is liberation. We've been attached to conventional realities, but when we see the five aggregates for what they are, then everything flips over and there is freedom from the conventions. When we put down the burden of the five aggregates, we feel lightness. This is what I'd like you all to understand. Like the monks, the Mer Chis talked amongst themselves of how Luang Po always seemed to address exactly the issues that they were facing in their practice and wanted to ask him about. As Mer Chi Bunyu recalled, when he taught the Dhamma, it was clear to them that he genuinely believed in their capacity to liberate themselves from suffering and he wanted to help them in every way he could. He taught us to abandon craving, not to attach to an idea of self, to see impermanence. We practice as he recommended and we saw the truth of what he taught. I determined to follow his teachings and saw that they were the path to liberation from suffering. He taught us not to be deluded by the physical body, to let go, to abandon attachment, to put things down. I was inspired by his teachings. I fully accepted them and practiced accordingly, and I had no thoughts of returning to the world. When he came to give a talk, if there were a lot of newly ordained mechis present, he'd speak on a basic level, about not arguing or contending, knowing the meaning of the precepts. On the intermediary level, he'd talk about training to abandon greed, hatred and delusion, attachment to views and conceit, 
how to practice once our precepts were purely kept. On the highest level, he'd talk about what you'd see and what you'd experience when you practiced. He'd talk about the purpose of becoming a nun, about the highest goal of a monastic life. He would talk about Nibbana and Anatta and there being nothing worth attaching to. Sometimes he might ask an older Merchi, do you know what the state of your mind will be at the point of death? He taught us to know the knowing in the knowing, not the knowing of heat and cold, of pleasure and pain, of day and night, but the knowing in the knowing. The Duty of a Samana On one occasion, while addressing the Mechis, Luang Po returned to an old and potent theme, how to make the most of monastic life, how to live as a true Samana. Progress in the Dhamma began with the cultivation of a sense of urgency. The days and nights are relentlessly passing. That's what it says in the books. What are you doing right now? What does it mean to you to be a mere chi? If you say that you've come to abandon defilements, then do you know what the defilements are? Can you recognize the unwholesome qualities in your mind? Are you abandoning defilements? Are you resisting them? What are you thinking right now? What are you doing? Are you thinking wisely or foolishly? Are you thinking jealous thoughts, angry ones? Is there desire in your mind? Examine the present moment. Lung Po said that now they had left the lay life, the Buddha was asking them questions. He was asking, Are you conducting yourself like a summoner yet? Are you speaking like a summoner? Do you eat like a summoner? He warned them against living heedlessly. Living too comfortably was an obstacle to practice. He said that the way of the summoner is to put constant effort into abandoning greed, hatred and delusion. It is through that effort that the summoner earned the respect and support of lay Buddhists. But if lay Buddhists did praise their practice, they should treat those words of praise with caution. If they were not true, then after hearing those words of unearned praise, they should put forth effort to become worthy of them. Luang Po said that the reason people don't let go of defilements is that they haven't seen the suffering inherent in them and so are reluctant to abandon their attachment. Greed, hatred and delusion arise in our minds because of our wayward thinking. A person with wrong view will not find peace even in the most conducive environment. Wrong view always brings suffering in its wake. Only right view leads to peace. Peaceful states of mind, developed in one holding wrong views, will never lead to wisdom. Only the calm informed by right view can support insight into the way things are. He stressed that it's right view that enables a summoner to know how to adapt, to know how to live in a large community, how to live in a small community, how to live alone. When right view has been developed, living in a large community feels no different from living alone. The harmony of the group is a vital, supportive factor for practice. Chanting together, meditating together, working together all foster the harmony of the group. When other mere chis act poorly, he said, then be aware that this is because their Dhamma practice is not yet strong enough to overcome their defilements. Some have deeply ingrained bad habits. They have never created the conditions for wisdom and letting go in the past. Make allowances for them. You still got defilements. You still got craving. So you try. You increase the number of practices you've taken on. You examine your body, speech and mind every day. Where are the shortcomings? You extend the bits that are too short. Whatever's too long, you cut it off.